Hi, welcome to Build Picker. I'm John. In this video, we're going to take an in-depth look at the impact of RAM performance on the Intel i5-13600K. If you're considering buying this CPU, then you're probably concerned about what kind of RAM you want to pair with it. What's going to perform best? Obviously, you could opt for a DDR5 kit, which is uh, becoming more available and more cost-effective now. There's high-performance uh, DDR4 kits, Samsung BDI, and kits you can overclock, as well as kits with some quite high specifications on XMP profiles. Or you could opt for a cost-effective, lower-cost DDR4 kit, something around 3200 to 3600 megahertz that you just fit and forget, plug and play with an XMP profile. Your decision as to what RAM you're going to get obviously impacts your motherboard choice, so it's something you need to consider quite early on in planning your build. In this video, we're going to go through a range of RAM speeds, both DDR4 and DDR5, to work out the inflection point of RAM performance. That is to say, where DDR5 consistently performs at least as well or better than DDR4 across a range of speed and timings. Once we've done that, we can assess the market as it is today and have a look at which options are going to be most cost effective for you. Because availability and pricing of DDR5 has improved markedly in the past year. And of course, DDR4 kits, the market is shifting there because things are going out of production and certain kits are actually getting harder to find and higher priced as a result. And then we'll make some recommendations for you just based upon your uh, intended use for the PC, what kit is going to be best for you. So, Jump on board and let's take a look at our performance numbers. So here are the RAM specs I've used throughout this testing and I've just referenced these numbers on the graph so that you can see without listing all the settings on the graphs and cluttering them up. For the DDR4 specs we've just run through, so we've got 2133 JDEX specification which is basically no XMP set and it's what happens if you don't set XMP. Um, some RAM defaults to 2133 MHz, some defaults to 2400 MHz, but nonetheless this is basic base timings as applied by JDEC with no XMP. We've then got a DDR4 3200 MHz kit with the timings as shown, and that's just set as XMP. Then we have DDR4 3600 MHz CL16 kit, again with the timings as shown here. As we move up past 3600 MHz, we've got a DDR4 4400 MHz kit. At 4400 MHz, that is XMP. It's got relatively loose timings, although the speed does make up for that a little bit in total latency terms. And at 4400 MHz, it only runs at gear 2, that is with the memory controller running at half the speed. However, down at DDR4 4000 and DDR4 4200 MHz, we have managed to run that in gear 1 to 1 on these CPUs, meaning that the memory controller is running at either 2000 or 2100 MHz, and with those timings tightened as well. Overall, this should be some of the highest performance RAM in this test. Then we move on to our DDR5 RAM, and in the first instance we've got DDR5 4800 MHz, again with uh, loose timing, so you can see and that's the JDEC default with no XMP set. We've then run through three speeds, just DDR5 5200, DDR5 5600 and DDR5 6000 MHz with those same primary timings, which is the XMP timings for that kit, and I've just downclocked it to lower speeds to see what effect that had on our overall testing. Okay then, so let's move on to our testing results. First of all, here's 3D Mark Firestrike, and I include this just because in the past it has shown decent RAM scaling. And here what we actually see is that the DDR4 appears to outperform the DDR5 RAM across the board. In fact, the DDR5 RAM seems to scale backwards. I'm not quite sure what's going on with this one. Whilst the DDR4 does show good RAM scaling, as we'd expect, with the DDR4 4400 perhaps being penalised by that Gear 2 setting, otherwise the results are pretty close. We're perhaps not seeing the clear RAM scaling we should do in this test. 3D Mark Time Spy shows much more clear RAM scaling. Here we see the DDR5, the higher speed settings, grouped up towards the top. And it does appear that DDR5 is preferred in this test, as it beats all but the DDR4 4200MHz overclocked RAM. Moving down then, we see the scaling through the DDR4 speeds and timings, with DDR4 2133 being by far the worst performer here, it clearly does give serious detriment to this test. That's just a warning as to what happens if you don't set XMP. Moving on then, we're looking at Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and this is just the CPU game results. This is the results shown in the internal benchmark, and it's not the overall uh, benchmark result. However, I have listed the overall average there, just so that you can see the impact of this, or rather the lack of impact of this RAM, on the overall performance of the game. Starting at the lowest end, we can see again that DDR4 at uh, those very low JDEC uh, 2133 MHz speeds is heavily detrimental to the game, and it is the only one where we get a really significant drop in overall performance as well, down at 177 frames per second. 
Moving up through, we see scaling through DDR4, but we do see DDR5, the slower RAM there, roughly equaling DDR4-3200 or DDR4-3600 MHz RAM. Again, DDR5 does pretty well in this test with those higher speeds, DDR5-5600 and DDR5-6000, performing very consistently with good overall FPS. The very highest performing RAM is the DDR4-4000 and DDR4-4200 MHz RAM, with that overclocking really helping just raise the last few FPS out of the game. However, I want to note that there's really no appreciable difference here in the performance of any of these RAM kits above 3200 MHz. You will perceive exactly the same performance in game. Moving on then to Rainbow Six Siege, we're actually approaching the bitter limits of our ability to really discern between these RAM kits in this game. This CPU performs remarkably well across the board. Again, we see DDR4 2133 right down at the bottom end. It is giving a roughly 50 FPS to 100 FPS hit versus the best kits here, but it's still achieving 489 FPS average. We then move up with DDR5 kits, the uh, 4800, 5200 MHz kit, doing decently well, but uh, they're not able to beat the DDR4 kits in this test. We're looking at 3200 MHz and 3600 MHz doing really well with around 550 to 560 FPS average. And then the DDR5-6000 scores 568 FPS average. Once again, it's those overclocked Gear 1 DDR4 kits that achieve ultimate performance in this test with over 600 FPS average and very consistent minimums as well, which indicate a good consistent gameplay. Once again, we're just approaching the limits of what we can really ascertain with RAM speed scaling in this test. And whilst there is a difference that can be demonstrated here, particularly with the scaling across the speeds, personally I would say it's probably not worthwhile the money and time invested to get those last few FPS, if, unless that really is the be all and end all. All of these kits are performing incredibly well on this CPU. Forza Horizon 5's benchmark is really interesting because it gives us a whole range of uh, internal metrics to look at, and here I've picked out a few that I feel are most representative of the kind of performance increase we can get with some well-specified RAM. There's two key areas we're looking at here. The sim indicates the game engine, and then we've got the render engine as well, which is a separate process that runs on the CPU, and I thought they might react slightly differently to RAM. As it turns out, they don't really, and we can see the scaling broadly improving across the board, and it's in line with our previous results. At the very lowest end, we've got that base JDEC 2133MHz RAM, demonstrating why you always want to ensure you at least set XMP, and then we scale up slowly through 3200MHz DDR4. DDR5 at 5200MHz gives decent account of itself in the mid-range. Then we've got DDR4 3600. We've got the Gear 2 DDR4 4400 up in the middle. And then as we improve, we've got the DDR5 higher speed kits followed by the overclocked DDR4 Samsung b die kits. Again, these are all internal numbers. And actually the overall SIM performance was almost identical in all cases here, except for on that DDR4 2100 kit, which did take around a 20 FPS uh, hit to the overall performance of the game. Everything else ran rock solidly at about 185 to 190 FPS total. And in fact, it was GPU limited throughout. And that's at 1080p on an RTX 3080. And to close out, we ran our flight simulator testing as well, using the same RAM kits as you can see. Again, we see scaling here, but it's pretty subtle, and it's only once you take the broad spread of RAM you can really start to appreciate any trends. Again, we see the slowest RAM, the DDR4 JDEC, performing pretty badly with 80 FPS average, and there's actually 30 FPS more on offer here with the best performing kits. Into the mid-range we see DDR4-3200 through to DDR4-4400, performing pretty similarly to the DDR5-5200, 5600 and 6000 MHz RAM. There really isn't a lot to choose between these three, and particularly with the 0.1% lows, I'd just caution that they can be quite variable run to run, we do our best to minimise variance, but I wouldn't take 2 or 3 FPS in those numbers as a cast iron guarantee of better performance. There perhaps is something to be said for those overclocked kits and the slightly better performance of the DDR4-3600 in lifting those 0.1% lows, but I'd want to do a lot more runs to really confirm that. Overall here, again, we see the same sort of trends with DDR5-6000 MHz RAM performing broadly equivalently to DDR4-3600 MHz RAM, and again, the overclocked Gear 1 DDR4 kits up at 4000 MHz, providing the best performance in this test. Finally, we have a second benchmark, which is a 747 taking off at London Heathrow, and it does tend to be the most CPU-limited test that we run. 
Once again, you can see the overall average FPS scaling with RAM, and it conforms broadly to the trends we've already seen. So what are my conclusions then after all this testing? Well, first up, if we're looking at that inflection point, the point at which we can say that DDR5 RAM is at least as good as DDR4, good quality DDR4 in almost all circumstances, then in my opinion, that sits around DDR5 6000 MHz, CL36 or lower. In my testing, that's basically the tipping point where we're seeing that kit at least perform equivalently to DDR4 3600 MHz CL16 or better. It's worth noting that there are some caveats there. There are some places where DDR5 will simply perform worse than DDR4, just depending on how an application or game uses the memory. Conversely, there are some applications and processes where DDR5 vastly outperforms DDR4 and no DDR4 kit is going to outperform it. Things like video uh, processing, uh, certain applications within video processing, and uh, file compression do benefit markedly from DDR5. There's also certain games, such as the new Spider-Man game, where we're seeing marked uplift from DDR5 performance, just because those games and the game engines are coded to take advantage of DDR5's bandwidth. So I think going forward, DDR5 will be the sensible option. And if I was building a PC today with the uh, Intel 13th generation platform, I would build it on DDR5 as a default with a good 32 gigabyte kit, unless I had very specific uh, requirements. Those requirements, the points at which I would choose DDR4 over DDR5, basically amount to if I was incredibly cost conscious and I wanted the best possible value out of an i5-13600K, then a high performance DDR4 16 gigabyte kit, around 80 to 100 dollars spend, that's 80 to 100 pounds or euros as well, would get you very, very good performance on this chip as a gaming chip. However, I would suggest if you're that budget conscious, you could probably buy a more cost effective CPU along with motherboard and RAM, perhaps the upcoming i5-13400 CPUs, which look like they'll be really strong options, or the outgoing i5-12400s are really strong options and save you a good deal of money over this CPU. And if you're trying to build a budget gaming PC, that's where I'd go instead. The other option where you might be considering DDR4 is if you want the very highest performance in first person shooters and you want the highest FPS. My testing has shown that good quality DDR4, especially overclocked up at around 4000 megahertz, keeping that gear one memory ratio and dropping timings as low as possible, will yield performance is in excess of even high speed DDR5 kits. However, there's a big time investment involved in that. It is a very tortuous process, uh, finding and stabilizing a RAM overclocked to the point where it's consistently higher performing. Therefore, if you do want to do that, if that's your uh, jam, you're, a, you're, you're an enthusiast and you want to spend your time doing that, then I can heartily recommend that with the i5-13600K. I found it to have a very robust memory controller, managed to run the memory controller up around 2100 megahertz without any problem at all, allowing a 4200 megahertz uh, DDR4 kit uh, to be manually tuned. So if that's something that interests you, I can recommend it with the Intel 13th gen, but for the vast majority of buyers, I don't think that's actually the right option. For the bulk of people, what I would recommend is that if you're cost conscious, you can happily choose a 16 gigabyte kit of DDR4 3600 MHz CL16 and be sure you're getting good performance out of these CPUs. However, for most people, I think the sensible option right now is to get a cost effective kit of DDR5 6000 megahertz CL36 around there, 32 gigabytes. That should cost you around 150 to 180 dollars at the moment, which I consider a good price for good quality DDR5 RAM. And from there, you should be able to set XMP and get on with using your PC, and you'll have the benefits of performance, the benefits of a uh, platform that is supported going forwards. You'll be able to buy more RAM easily in future, and uh, you'll know that you're getting the best out of these CPUs as well. I really hope you found this video useful in informing your choice of RAM for the i5-13600K. If you're interested in the i7 or i9-13900K, I have repeated this testing with the i9-13900K and I'll be presenting those results as soon as I can. I've also got a bunch of testing I've done in terms of best cooling options for these CPUs, so if you're interested in that content, please do like and subscribe and you'll see those videos as soon as they're available to you. In the meantime, do check out buildpicker.com.